today is going to be the physics of cells, also known as the physics of bacteria. Uh, this is our first Google Hangout with Physics Today magazine in collaboration with the National Society of Physics Students and UCA, University of Central Arkansas chapter of the Society of Physics Students. Um, I hand it over to our speaker to take it away from here. Uh, great. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining in on this. Uh, uh, it's a bit of an experiment for me. I've never done this before, so, uh, so let's see how it goes. Uh, I want to thank Will for organizing this. It's, uh, it's, really, it's a real pleasure to try and do this uh, uh, thing over uh, Google. And, uh, and, uh, and so we talked about how we would do this. And so I'm thinking I'd, uh, I'd start off by uh, a uh, lecture on the of, uh, bacterial cells, and then maybe after we could uh, after we could have some uh, questions, and we can, uh, about questions about anything, I could definitely answer them. So, um, well, is the video is the is the audio okay? I, I seem to be getting a little bit of a reverb. You guys can hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's uh, let's get going. Um, so um, so what I wanted to tell you about today is the physics of uh, of how uh, cells how cells make decisions, and uh, and what I really wanted to do is to kind of give you a sense of why thinking about cells and what cells do is something that that's that's you know, uh, exciting for, uh, uh, as an exciting topic of research for physicists and why, um, why there's uh, quite a few of us now that have started, started our careers sort of in more traditional fields of physics and have uh, gotten enchanted by cells. Um, so that, that's really what I'd like to uh, convey today more, more than anything uh, specific about the research we do in my lab, but I'll touch upon that as well. So, uh, um, you know, so, so I mean, everyone has had a little bit of biology at some point. If nothing else, you were, you were, uh, you, you had that course in high school that maybe, like me, you hated. I really did not like biology in high school. Uh, I was really drawn to physics because there was math and there was nothing ma remotely mathematical in biology. But nonetheless, I, I, we did learn that you know cells do, do various kind of funny things. Like uh, here's a movie uh, that I just started on the left, which. Uh, which shows some red blood cells and a neutrophil, which is a white blood cell, and and the, this little uh, purple marker is showing a bacterial cell. And so this is something that a cell can do. It can chase uh, this white blood cell will chase this bacterial cell, um, and even though the bacterial cell is you know moving all over the place, maybe kind of trying to avoid it, it, it eventually catches up with it and engulfs it and uh, and kills the bacterial cell. And that's sort of our our. Uh, our immune system at work right there. Um, so, so that's one kind of behavior is, you know, swimming behavior. The cells, cells can move. Um, also, cells uh, exist in an environment where they're often surrounded by other cells, so they can be quite social. So, so, uh, so these are little uh, sort of amoeba-like cells which can actually come together and uh, form a colony. And this colony can then uh, form this interesting structure that looks like a little worm, which then can kind of go to a completely different space. Uh, Position in the environment and, and maybe seek out better, better, uh, uh, you know, better conditions for the cell survival. And then uh, maybe the most sort of uh, basic thing that cells do, and this is uh, a movie of an E. coli cell that I'm going to start now. In the in this bottom left corner, they can uh, grow and divide. So then you have the situation where uh, where um, where from uh, two cells you get one cell. And, uh, and the reason I'm showing these movies is actually all these movies pose really interesting problems uh, that uh, physicists are now getting involved in, in, in a big way uh, in trying to sort of uh, figure out how is it that uh, cells accomplish these uh, seemingly uh, complex tasks, or not just seemingly, but really complex tasks. And even something as simple as the cell division that I just showed you here. Right, so what you saw there, here I can show the movie again, it's, it's kind of very, it's a very simple thing. Uh, the cell be starts from being uh, one cell and becomes two cells. Even this movie uh, on the left, and it's also happening on the right, um, uh, provides us with a very interesting question. And the question is, how does the cell know where its middle is? Uh, 
Uh, so, so someone actually mentioned this to me about five years ago, and I, I had one of those moments where I sort of had to hit myself over over the head uh, with my hand, just thinking, well, how did I not think of this? Because um, you know, you see this movie, you see the cell dividing in the middle, but the question is, how does the cell determine its middle? There isn't like a little engineer inside the cell with a ruler uh, and that, that, that you know can kind of go around and, and figure out where the middle is. So somehow by virtue of there being molecules that are moving around in a random way by diffusion, which we'll talk about a lot, uh, the cell figures out where its middle is. And, and that's a really interesting problem, and there's some answers to this question, but by and large, we, we still don't know the, the, the full story. And finally, on, uh, here in the bottom right, uh, I'm, there's a looping movie uh, from Sunny G's lab, uh, close, close here at Harvard, and what you see in this movie, and it's going to start uh, right uh, about now, is you have these two cells that are black initially, or they're not showing any yellow color, or you have one cell, I should say, as you see here, and it's dividing into two cells, and one of these two daughter cells, this one in particular, is turning yellow. And the reason it's turning yellow is that the scientists here, what they did is they made one of the proteins that's, uh, that the cell produces uh, yellow. And so what you see here is that before the cell divided, none of the cells you see in the field of view here are making this yellow protein. And then when the cell divides, one of the daughter cells makes the yellow protein and the other one does not. And this raises at least two interesting questions, and we'll talk about both those questions. One is how does the cell decide, or how does it sort of end up going from a state where it's not making a yellow protein to a state where it is making a yellow protein, like this uh, daughter cell that's to the right, uh, which is making the yellow protein. And the other interesting question, which, which is something that we've been very excited recently, is how is it that these two daughter cells, which are genetically completely identical, and they're presumably in the identical environment, uh, the chemical environment, this uh, whole group of cells. Is. So how do these genetically identical cells, simple cells, these are bacterial cells, how is it that they uh, make different decisions? So one of the two daughter cells makes the yellow protein, and the other one does not. And as, you'll, as we'll uh, see a little bit later during the talk, uh, fundamentally, the, 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 the randomness that, that you observe here, the randomness having to do with one cell expressing yellow protein, the other one not, has to do with the fundamental underlying randomness of molecular motions uh, that are going on inside the cell that were originally described uh, you know, in 1905 by, by Einstein and others uh, before and after him. So, um, so that's, the, that's the, the goal of this, uh, of this little lecture, is trying to understand this movie or trying to get at... Uh, some of these questions that are posed by this movie that's that's now playing. How is it that the cell? How is it that, this, that these decisions to make proteins are made by cells? And then how is what is the random nature of this decision making? Where does it come from? And uh, okay, so in order to figure this out, let's start by thinking about what's inside this cell, inside this bacterial cell. So here on the on the left, you see a uh, this is a, the head of a needle. And, uh, and the little yellow dots you might see here, these are uh, bacterial cells. These are E. coli cells. There's a little ruler here. It tells you this is five micrometers, so five millionths of a meter, which tells you, just by looking at this picture, that one of these bacterial cells is a couple of micrometers across. And what's inside the cell? Well, there's a bunch of stuff, right? There's uh, water. There's, and we can kind of, we can make little back-of-the-envelope estimates and figure out that there's about... Uh, 20 billion water molecules inside that inside the cell. There's about 60 million uh, various types of uh, small inorganic ions like sodium, potassium. Um, then, uh, most importantly for us, there's DNA. We'll talk a lot about DNA, the carrier of genetic information. There's about 5 million base pairs of DNA. Uh, to turn that into some units that might be familiar to you, uh, one base pair is a third of a nanometer in length. So 5 million base pairs of DNA correspond to about 3 millimeters of DNA. That DNA is actually represented in this picture on the right as this cord that you see that's all coiled up and looped around inside uh, the bacterial cell. And the reason it has to be all folded up like that is because the length of the DNA is a few millimeters. And as I said earlier, the length of the cell is a couple of microns. So you have to fold up the DNA many thousand times over for it to fit inside the cell. 
And by the way, how this folding works and what the nature of this folding is is another really interesting topic where, again, there's a bunch of people from physics and computer science and biology and mathematics all engaged in research trying to figure this stuff out. So that's the DNA. We'll talk more about it. Then there's proteins. Those are kind of the, the working horse of the cell, and there's about 2 million of them inside E. coli. And, uh, and so, um, so this representation of the cell would like you to believe, which is what, you know, is kind of the classic view of the cell, which is what, what, what the view I've had, I had on, you know, probably uh, all throughout uh, my life until maybe 20 years ago uh, when I really started, or 10, 15 years ago when I really started thinking about biology, is that a cell is really, as depicted here, uh, simply a bag of chemicals. But, but that really couldn't be further from the truth. The way we, the modern view of the cell is that it's really a collection of protein machines. And these machines uh, do all sorts of interesting tasks inside the cell. So, for instance, here's a couple of movies that I borrowed from the web uh, where this is illustrated. So, the first movie that I'll start actually shows one such machine that exists, for instance, in all our cells. And these are machines that actually walk along these fibers that you see. The fibers that you see here are the cytoskeleton. That's a, that's a fibrous structure that exists inside every cell. This fibrous structure is constantly assembling itself, as, as shown in the movie, and then it also gets disassembled. So these are like highways in the cell, but these highways are constantly being made, and like shown here, and they're constantly falling apart. So they're very different than the kinds of highways that, that, that we use to transport goods. Uh, but nonetheless, these, these, are, these are highways on which transport occurs. And what I stopped the movie for a second. What's shown here is something called a kinesin molecule. It's a protein. And what this molecule does is that it grabs hold of cargo, which is this blue vesicle here, and then it literally walks along this, uh, this, this filament called a, called a microtubule. And it walks at 8 nanometers per second, and it exerts forces which are about a piquenewton, which is 10 to the minus 9th newton. All these things we can measure right now. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is this looks nothing like sort of what you would expect inside of a bag filled with chemicals would look like, where you expect it to be completely dominated by sort of random thermal motion. This looks very regular. And, um, and, and that's what I mean by saying uh, that the, well, that's what I mean. By say, that's what we mean when we say that cells are protein machines. Now, now here at the bottom, here's another very cool machine. So this is actually the energy plant of the cell. So this, this machine actually literally rotates, as shown here. And the reason it rotates is because there's, a, there's essentially a stream of ions going through it. So it works like a hydroelectric power plant, except instead of water rushing through it, there are ions rushing through it. That makes the machine rotate. And as it rotates, it actually produces chemical energy in the form of ATP, which, which are these little green molecules that see flying around. So this is how all the energy that's being used by our cells in our body is actually produced in the cell by these energy producing machines called ATP synthases. And there are many, many other such machines, and they're all made of proteins. And the cell manages to do all those amazing things that I showed you before by, sim by, in, by virtue of having these machines and by, these mach and by virtue of these machines performing specific tasks. Nonetheless, these machines, are, of course, are still governed by the laws of physics and chemistry in particular. They're so small, they're nanometers in size, is that their fluctuations, the Brownian motion of these machines becomes very important, and that's something that I want to turn to next. But before I talk about that, I want to tell you a little bit about the machines for protein production, because these are the machines that we'll be considering when we consider the question of how is it that a bacterial cell produces a protein and makes the decision to produce the protein or makes the decision not to produce the protein. So the way proteins are produced in cells is from DNA. DNA, as shown in this diagram here, contains the information for producing proteins. What that means is that there's a machine called the RNA polymerase, uh, schematicized here. This machine moves along DNA. It reads the message on the DNA encoded in nucleotides and this mess and this and this language has four letters to it. They're depicted as ATCG, chemical sort of notation. And as the polymerase moves along the DNA, it reads the message, ATC, ATG, whatever it is. And as it reads it, it produces a copy of the message called RNA, ribonucleic acid. So this molecule then, called messenger RNA, because it contains the message that's being read, is then read by another machine called the ribosome, and it translates the code 
which is made out of these uh, A, T's, C, G's, etc. It translates that code three by three into a chain of amino acids, which makes a protein. And if this chain of amino acids then folds up in the cell to produce a protein. So this is depicted in these two movies that I'm going to start now. So the first one shows you this little blue object. That's the RNA polymerase. It's moving along the red thing, which is DNA. As it moves through the DNA, it's spewing out this yellow molecule that you see at the top. That's the messenger RNA. It's moving at about 100 to 1,000 base pairs a second, which means it's moving uh, essentially uh, a, like 100 nanometers a second. Um, on the other hand, when this mRNA is made, here's the yellow molecule, that's the message, uh, it will be read by another machine that assembles on it called the ribosome. And so now this machine, a little more slowly, it moves about oh, uh, tens to a hundred uh, nucleotides per second. As it moves along, it reads, it reads, the, it reads the, the message and produces, uh, produces a protein. Uh, so if we wait a little bit longer, I believe, uh, we'll get back to our, can speed it up, we get back to uh, seeing the, uh, the protein being produced, that's this red uh, molecule that was coming out of the blue machine. So there are these two processes, the process of transcription, when DNA is read and made into messenger RNA, and the process of translation, where messenger RNA is read by ribosomes and a protein is produced. The end result is the information encoded in the DNA is transferred uh, to proteins. In other words, it's used to produce a protein, so it's read like a blueprint. And decisions that cells make, and, what, and these decisions come in all forms and shapes. For instance, the decision of an E. coli cell might make is to eat a particular sugar or not to eat a particular sugar. In order to eat a particular sugar, it needs the enzymes, which are proteins that can degrade that sugar. An enzyme is a protein, and whether it eats the sugar or not, that decision is essentially made by making or not making the protein that's used to degrade the sugar. So, uh, so all cellular decisions or most cellular decisions are about which proteins to make. Again, these proteins are encoded on the DNA, but it doesn't mean that all proteins encoded on the DNA are made. Um, a simple example of that is if you look at the different kinds of cells that make up a human body. A nerve cell uh, and say a, a cell, uh, a skin cell, uh, they have the exact same DNA, they have the exact same blueprints inside of them, but they're radically different. And the reason they're radically different is that these two cells have made different decisions about which of the 20,000 or so proteins that are encoded on the DNA, which of those to make and which of those not to make. And that's where the differences in the function of the cell come from. So how do does, how does cells make these decisions? So this has been something that people have been working on uh, since the 30s or 40s. A couple of Nobel, or more than a couple of Nobel Prizes have been given out in, 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 in due course. Uh, and biology has come up with a very elegant and beautiful answer. And maybe at its simplest, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, process of either making a protein out of a gene or not making out of a protein out of a gene uh, can be depicted with this little diagram that you'll find in most introductory cell biology books. So it's the diagram that, that describes how genes are turned on or off. So let me explain that. So here uh, is a little uh, piece of the DNA, uh, which is a gene, uh, which contains a gene. So the gene is a sequence of the DNA that's shown here to the right. And now to, to produce a protein, as I described before, the first thing that has to happen is the machine, the RNA polymerase, has to get on the gene and read the gene. Um, and there's a piece of the DNA that's in front of the gene called a promoter, and that's the piece that, that the RNA polymerase, the machine that makes uh, RNA, the RNA-making machine, I'll call it from now on, that's the piece that the RNA-making ma machine recognizes. It recognizes it by simply electrostatic interactions. It recognizes a charge pattern that exists on this piece of DNA called the promoter. So uh, this RNA-making machine recognizes the promoter DNA, binds there, and then moves along the gene, as, as we saw in that previous movie, and reads the gene, and the protein is eventually made. Now, that would be a state of the gene when the gene is on, but the way the gene can be turned off is if, the mo if inside the cell there is another protein, which we'll call the repressor, and if this protein can also bind to this region of the DNA called the promoter, well, if that happens, if a repressor binds to this region, then the polymerase is now obstructed. It can no longer bind to this promoter region 
region of the DNA. And because it can no longer bind to this promoter region of the DNA, it cannot read the gene and the gene is off. So no protein is made. So genes are turned on and off by different proteins that bind to DNA. This is kind of this basic discovery that was made uh, starting with some research done in France in the 1940s, culminating in a series of papers in the 60s by two French scientists called uh, Jacob and Monod, who got then the Nobel Prize for this research. So, um, so now, based on this cartoon, we can describe what's going on in this movie shown in the left. So what's going on in this movie is that the cell, all these E. coli cells that you see in the movie, uh, they have the same DNA, and this DNA contains the gene for the yellow protein. It just happens that in some of these cells, the ones that you see that are black, that are not showing yellow fluorescence, in those cells the gene is off. The gene is off because there is a repressor protein bound to the promoter, and therefore in those cells the yellow protein is not made. On the other hand, in other cells the gene is on, and in those cells the yellow protein is made, and you see the cell lighting up yellow. So, so that's a perfectly valid description, and, uh, and there's really nothing more to add to it. But uh, <clears throat> what this description doesn't really then still tell us is, well, a couple of things. First of all, it doesn't really tell us, well, if the gene is on, how much of this yellow protein is made? Is it, is it a lot? Is it five, ten, a thousand, a million? Uh, the other question that has an answer, doesn't answer is, well, why is it then that in some cells the gene is on and the gene is off? If it's all about chemistry and the chemical environment of these cells, or it's all about these proteins binding to the DNA, and there's nothing uh, random in the environment, or, or I should say that the environment that these two cells, these two daughter cells are identical, um, if the environment is identical and the genes are identical, how is it that one gene is on and the other gene is off? Um, to explain these uh, phenomena, we really have to resort to physics, and we have to go back and think about the, these molecules and think about what is it that uh, the, mo the motions, what is, it, what is it that the dynamics of these molecules are all about. And, uh, and so let's now put on our physics hat. We have a we have a problem that we're trying to solve, and I'll show you actually some data to uh, go with this problem. And the problem we're trying to solve is what determines the amount of gene expression. So what I've shown you here in this diagram is kind of a uh, sort of a Boolean logic approach to gene expression. Gene expression is on, gene expression is off. It makes it sound like the process of making proteins is a uh, binary thing, but it's not. Some cells can make a lot of proteins, some can make a little, some can make something in between. So we'd like to be able to compute, to calculate the amount of protein made, the amount of this yellow protein made. And the other thing we'd like to do is try to figure out why is it that sometimes the protein is made and sometimes it's not. So <clears throat> let's think like physicists. So if we're talking about the macroscopic world, of course, it's governed by Newton's laws. And so if we look at the motion of a particle, here's my little cart this little cartoon I've made, shows a billiard ball bouncing around a uh, billiard, and the key thing about this motion is that it's predictable, right? So if we know, and this is what we, uh, we learn in our classes on mechanics, if we know the initial position and velocity of this particle, and we know, the, you know where the walls are and so forth, we can predict with absolute certainty the motion of this particle. Well, <clears throat> if we were to shrink this billiard ball, billiard table, this little billiard table that I've drawn here, by a factor of a million. That would actually get this down to the scale of a cell, right? Uh, that would get this down to the scale of a micrometer, one millionth of a meter. Well, in that world, when we're at the scale of the cell, if we were to look at a little ball, a little molecule, which is the size of, say, a few nanometers, which is the size of a typical protein, well, its motion would be completely random, and this random motion is called Brownian motion, and was first described when botanist Brown observed it in pollen as it, was, as it was moving in a random fashion in water. It was thought that this random motion had something to do with the, with the object being observed uh, being alive, but it turned out not to be so. In fact, it was in 1905, in the, in the year of the three miracles that were uh, sort of uh, <clears throat> made, put forward by Einstein, right? One was the theory of relativity, the other was the this, the explanation of the photoelectric effect, and the third 
And actually, the most published paper, most cited paper, I should say, of Einstein was this one, which which explained the Brownian motion of small particles. So what Einstein and here's a movie showing uh, this Brownian motion of spheres that are uh, plastic spheres that are about a micron in size. And what Einstein sort of eventually ex described is that this random motion of these spheres is really there because of the of the constant bombardment of this uh, of these micron sized object, but even smaller objects, in this case water molecules, which are undergoing random thermal motion. So the blue water molecules are moving around at random. They hit the big red molecule once in a while, and when it, they hit it, they transfer some momentum to it, and the molecule moves left and right in a essentially unpredictable random way. Uh, so, uh, so if we now think about uh, our problem, namely the problem of gene expression, we can uh, we can now adopt this language of random motion, of Brownian motion, and we can start to understand, or at least qualitatively, start to build up a picture of how is it that these, uh, what is it, what is going on at the molecular level when genes are being turned on and genes are being turned off. So instead of this simple biological cartoon shown on the right where either a polymerase is bound and the gene is on, so either the machine that makes uh, RNA, which eventually is made into protein, is bound and the gene is on, or this other molecule is bound and the gene is off, instead of this cartoon, what maybe we should have is a little movie like shown here. And what I'm going to show in this movie is the same object, namely the polymerase shown with this little bean-like object and the repressor, which is this little... Uh, blue square, a dark blue square shown here. And what's going to be going on is, of course, they're undergoing random Brownian motion. So the repressor is going to be undergoing some random Brownian motion, and so is this blue molecule. Now, the blue molecule can stick to the DNA, meaning there's some kind of a energy, uh, binding energy. So there's, in other words, there's some kind of a Velcro-like thing that, would, that when the blue molecule, the repressor, is on the DNA, it likes to sit there. But, of course, once in a while, it will be hit by a water molecule or some other molecule hard enough that it will be displaced from the DNA. And that's, that's, that was the little motion that you saw earlier when the, when the, when the dark blue molecule uh, left, I'll repeat the movie, left the DNA. So the dark blue molecule, the repressor, will leave the DNA like so. When it leaves the DNA, it will you know, mostly be around the DNA, so there's a large chance it will rebind to the DNA like so. And as long as this dark blue molecule, the repressor is on the DNA, the polymerase can't bind. But eventually, just by pure luck, the big blue, the little blue molecule, the repressor, will move away from the DNA, and just at that moment, by random chance, the RNA polymerase will move in and be able to bind to the promoter DNA. And when that happens, it will start producing the messenger RNA, which is the little green thing showing up here. So that's the physicist's view of this biological cartoon. That's what Einstein tells us we should be thinking about when we think about uh, the motion of these proteins and, uh, in, and, you know, the motion of these proteins in the context of this process of turning genes on and off. Now, the cool thing about physics, of course, is that we can take, you know, we can express these cartoons in mathematics. And by doing so, we can make very detailed a quantitative predictions about these processes. And the way we can turn this, these cartoons into mathematics is using uh, statistical mechanics, because statistical mechanics is that part of physics that tells us, that talks about the random motions of molecules. And so, uh, so for instance, and uh, I'm not going to spend too much time going through the statistical mechanics, but for instance, the way statistical mechanics then can be used to treat this problem is the following. So if I go back to the movie uh, that I showed you here, uh, what we see, what we'd like to describe mathematically is the probability, right, the probability that at any given time the RNA polymerase is bound to this DNA because the higher that probability, the larger fraction of the time this RNA polymerase is on the DNA and the more protein will be produced. So, uh, how do we compute that probability? Well, the way we compute the probability of this RNA polymerase being on the DNA is we say, aha, well, let me think of this DNA, that this gene and the promoter, as a three-state 
Boltzmann machine. What do I mean by that? Well, as shown in the biological diagram, either the DNA is just empty, there's no molecules there, or there's a polymerase, or there's this repressor molecule. But for each of these states now we can write down a Boltzmann weight, a, not, a, a probability, if you will, of this state occurring. And how do we do that? Well, Boltzmann taught us how to do that. He said, well, if you want the probability of the state, the thing you need is the energy of that state. And then the probability of that state is proportional to the exponential of the energy, where the energy is measured in units of kT, the thermal unit of energy. This little beta here is uh, 1 over uh, kT, the thermal unit of energy, which at energy is where, which at temperatures where all this is happening, namely where you have the cells living, that thermal unit of energy is 4 times 10 to the negative 21 joules, or 4 piconewton nanometers. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, Boltzmann tells us that, but then of course also if there's uh, a number of polymerases in the, if P denotes the number of polymerases in the cell, then the probability of finding a polymerase on the DNA is going to be proportional to that P, because each one of these polymerases has a chance of binding, so the probability will be P times greater. And this fraction, here, the, this, this number in the, and so this number of polymerases, I should say, in the cell is about a few thousand, we know that. Uh, on the, and then, of course, how likely is that the polymerase binds to the specific place on the DNA, the specific place where the gene is? Well, that depends on how many other binding sites there are, because if there's a lot, of, a lot of other places it can bind on the DNA, then it's not so likely it will bind to that one specific place that we're interested in, namely the place where the gene is, the gene that makes that yellow protein. And the number of those uh, places is really the size of the DNA. Uh, I, this is denoted here as the number of non-specific sites, and the size of the DNA is 5 million. So P is about a few thousand, and this number, NNS, is a few million, or more precisely, 4.8 million, the size of the E. coli genome. And similarly, the probability of this that this repressor will bind is proportional to the number of repressors. The factor of two here has to do with the fact that the repressor molecule turns out has something like two binding sites, or two legs, as shown here. And then, of course, again, there's this uh, denominator, which is 5 million, which has to do with the number of uh, bases of the genome. These are all the other sites where it's combined. And here's another energy factor, right? This energy factor has to do with what is the energy of binding. So in other words, how much energy is released uh, when, uh, when this molecule binds uh, to the, or how much, I should say, is the energy of the whole system lowered when this red molecule, the repressor, binds to the DNA. So now you have these unnormalized probabilities, and then in each of these states, the gene is either being transcribed, so the transcription rate is zero, or it's something else. We don't know what it is, it's R, let's call it, or it's zero. But you see, now that we have these weights, what we can do is we can normalize them, which means we divide each of these weights with the sum of the three weights, that gives us probabilities, and then we, these probabilities, we, we can compute the average transcription rate. This is what we do in statistical mechanics all the time. And when we compute the average transcription rate, well, that is really equivalent to computing the amount of protein produced. Because the amount of protein produced will be proportional to the amount of mRNA produced, which is proportional to the average amount of transcription in the cell. So uh, we can define then a quantity. This is just for experimental reasons. We can define a quantity which is a measure which is a measure of the average transcription rate, uh, but a normalized measure. And in fact, so just to explain that briefly, what we do here is we take the transcription rate, uh, the average transcription rate when there's no repressors, and then the average transcription rate is large because you can't be in this off state down here, and then divided by the transcription rate when the repressors are present. The quantity is called repression. In other words, it's a quantity that tells you how effective is this red molecule at blocking transcription. And so this repression will always be greater than 1 because the average transcription rate without repressor is always bigger than the average transcription rate in the presence of repressor. And then just by doing the mathematics that I just explained for you, we get an expression for this quantity called the repression. It's a very simple expression. It says it's 1 plus 2R over the number of nonspecific sites with an, expo with an exponential of the energy of the binding of the repressor to the DNA. What's critical is that this repression, and I'll show you in a second, is something that we can measure in cells. 
So even if you didn't follow, and I really don't want to belabor this, if you didn't follow the math that led to this expression, the point is the following. Just by taking this biological cartoon, running essentially forward an algorithm that was put forward to us by Boltzmann that we teach students in statistical mechanics, we can arrive at an expression, and this expression tells us how much gene expression is there in the cell as a function of the number of repressors in the cell, which is this R, and as a function of the energy of binding of repressors to the DNA. This is critical because in experiments these days we can tune both these quantities. We can change R and we can change this binding energy so we can do what we always like to do as physicists. We can test this theory. We can test this equation. And how do we do that? Well, and I'll finish up in, a, in, in, in the next five minutes. The way we do that is we measure in single cells the amount of gene expression. Just like in those movies, we have a bunch of E. coli cells. Different cells produce different amounts of protein, so they glow with different amounts of yellow, green. Um, and so we can then make a histogram and see how many cells have different amounts of fluorescence. Okay? We can do that in the presence of repressor or in the absence of repressor or when we change the number of repressors. And what will happen as we change the number of repressors, if we have a lot of repressors, the cells will not make this protein. And so this uh, fluorescence intensity on average will be low. On the other hand, if we don't have the repressor, there will be lots of gene expression and the fluorescence intensity of the cells will be large. And, that, and so by measuring fluorescence, we can measure the amount of gene expression. And so here's, for instance, uh, sort of one example of this kind of experiment that was done a couple of years ago at Caltech in Rob Phillips's group. And what they did is exactly what I said before. They made E. coli cell mutants. And these mutants, the way, what I mean by mutants is the following. They made cells in which they varied two quantities, both which are encapsulated by this formula. They vary R, the number of repressors, the number of these molecules that combine uh, at, at the DNA and prevent the polymerase that binding. So they vary the number of repressors. In other words, they make mutant cells. In some cells, like this HG104 cell, there's about 11 of these repressors. In another cell, for instance, the RBS1 cell, there's 610 repressors. So we know, or we expect qualitatively, is that in the cell with 610 repressors, there will be a lot less gene expression. In other words, those cells will glow a lot less bright. In the cells with only 11 repressors, they'll, be, they'll glow more bright. Right? And this formula tells us by how much they'll be, those cells will be glowing on average brighter or less bright. The other thing that can also vary is the sequence of the DNA to which the repressor molecule binds. That corresponds to varying this energy. And then they can measure this repression quantity simply by measuring the average fluorescence, the average brightness of the cells. So they can measure repression, they control R, and they control this quantity, delta epsilon RD. In other words, they can test this formula. And so the way, it, and the way this test was done here, for instance, is that what they did is they measured the repression for each one of these strains, uh, in other words, for different values of R, and for each value of R, they extracted a value of the binding energy. If the theory is right, that binding energy should not depend on which strain they use. Therefore, the theory predicts that, the bind, that this plot of the binding energy versus the strain should be a flat line. In fact, this binding energy was measured before, so the prediction is that in the case of one sequence, for instance, this O3 sequence, this is one of these sequences that changes the binding energy, the prediction is that all the data should fall on this line, and the red line, the data, red, red data should fall on the flat red line, the green data should fall on the green uh, flat line. So in other words, to the extent that the data are lying on these flat lines, and you see there's some variation, there's some noise, it's not as, as precise as measuring the fine structure constant by any stretch of the imagination, but it's still getting to the point where it's starting to look a lot like physics. It's, it's, we have quantitative data, we have theory, and we can test the theory against quantitative data. And by doing so, we're testing a specific model of how genes are expressed. So uh, um, I think I will, I will kind of stop here because uh, I think I'm talking a little too long. But uh, we can also incorporate the random, we can incorporate the random of these fluctuations in a different kind of model where we take into account the
the probability that uh, a polymerase is bound versus not bound, and the probability is dictated by the time over which we observe. And uh, by doing that, we can actually then describe experiments like the one shown here, where the experimentalists are following for each cell the amount of expression as a function of time. So this space is completely random. But if we make a bunch of these spaces, we can collect the statistics and we can compare the variance in the number of, uh, of the number of uh, proteins produced to that predicted by a theory. And again, here's an example where theory predicts the red line and the data are the scattered points of the red line. Just to kind of make a sense of how well theory and the experiment can be compared in these, in these situations. So uh, let me just finish then by making a couple of points. Uh, I've talked about gene expression. I've talked about the fact that it is greatly affected by molecular motions, which are random, which are, which are essentially Brownian molecules. And by thinking about these Brownian motions using statistical mechanics, explain the behavior of the average population, average population, and we can also explain the noise. And there's been a lot of noise about noise. There's been a lot of research about noise. The fact that different cells express different amounts, that different, that I, I should say, sorry, genetically identical cells can have completely, can be expressing completely different amounts of proteins. And, uh, and this is very interesting because it turns out it was discovered first in the context of tuberculosis. And here's and something called persistence. And let me explain that because it's just too cool. So the idea is the following. So imagine these little red things here are tuberculosis cells, and this is really what happens. If you treat them with antibiotics, what will happen is uh, you will kill most of these cells. Or, you know, you'll administer antibiotics and the patient will, you know, uh, will, 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 will get better and there will be no tuberculosis. But then people found a little while later, all of a sudden the patient the patient can get tuberculosis again. And when they isolated the cells that are causing this, they found they did not mutate. They're the same cells they, that they had before. In other words, when they regained the illness, the cells that were causing this, the bacteria that were causing this, were still, could still be treated with the same antibiotic. In other words, they were not resistant to antibiotics. So how come they weren't killed? That was the puzzle. And so they, what they realized is that there's a subpopulation, those are these black guys here, there's a subpopulation of the bacterial cells that are resistant to antibiotics. As it turns out, the subpopulation is like one in every 10 million cells, and they don't grow very fast. But how is it that inside this genetically identical population, there's a subpopulation of cells that are resistant to, the, to antibacterial drugs and do not grow very fast, so they behave very differently? Well, in these cells in particular, because of all this randomness at the molecular scale, in these cells, certain genes have been turned on, in particular genes that are responsible for giving those cells the resistance to, uh, to, to, to the antibiotic. In other words, by having randomness in gene expression, uh, bacterial cells are able to diversify, make bets. In other words, make it so that part of their population, even though there is no antibiotic, is going to be resistant to antibiotics. So they're kind of anticipating the future by doing this in some way. It's fascinating and it also seems like a strategy that's employed by certain viruses. Most of it has been demonstrated, most of this has been demonstrated in, in HIV viruses, and there's also some evidence that cancer cells are doing some of this dastardly work. So uh, also, and, I, and you know, and then the other reason we're interested in genetic noise is that people are trying to make genetic circuits to put inside people for various therapeutics, and noise can, can make those uh, genetic circuits malfunction, so we'd like to be able to control noise. Okay, so let me just finish there, and, and hopefully I've given you a sense of uh, these molecular machines inside cells, the fact that they operate in random fashion, in particular the machines that are responsible for producing proteins do this. And because of this, cells behave as individuals, even when equipped with the same DNA and confronted with the same environment. Now this is, first of all, this observation and this fact is really rewriting a lot of biology. But at the same time, which I think is more important for you guys, it's a really fun playground for physicists to be involved in, and there's certainly much, much more to come. So uh, I should just finally say who the people responsible for this work are. 
the way things work in my lab is I collaborate a lot with biologists, in particular Jeff Gellis is a biochemist in Brandeis, and Rob Phillips is a physicist who also has a biology lab, uh, so he's kind of an interesting chimera who works at Caltech, and Lakra, Alvaro, Tim, Sandeep, James, and Anon are various students uh, that we've advised over the years, some undergraduates like Lakra, who've uh, tremendously uh, sort of, uh, um, who've been tremendous in, in bringing this, this work uh, to the light of day. So thanks all for uh, your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, I will be happy to take them, and I will reveal myself again. Okay, do we have any questions? All right, say it loud. Okay, so you talked about being able to vary certain factors that affected the amount of gene expression whenever you went over that one equation. Now you could vary the amount of, uh, of that, was it the resistor or whatever, the thing that locked it. Is that something that the cell can do on its own? Like, can it vary to like, different conditions? Like, in different environments? Like, can you have different environments? Okay. Yeah, no, you. you uh, um, um, yeah, no, you, you hit the nail on the head. So, uh, so, uh, so what these guys, uh, Jacob and Mano figured out in the 60s is that uh, depending on the, uh, uh, so here's something very cool. So uh, E. coli normally likes glucose. Okay, so, uh, but if glucose is not around, it will eat lactose. On the other hand, if there's glucose and lactose, it doesn't eat the lactose. It's kind of like uh, um, there used to be this thing, the Pepsi challenge. Does anyone know what the Pepsi challenge is? Raise your hands. Yeah. So okay. So you're given Coke and Pepsi. I like Coke. Who likes Coke? Anyway. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Uh, so bottom line is, you know, if there's, you know, if there's Coke, you'll all of us will drink Coke. But if you go to a restaurant and they say, sorry, we only serve Pepsi, I'll take the Pepsi, right? So E. coli does the exact same thing. And the way it does this is exactly by, by what you just said. So what happens is when, uh, when lactose, uh, sorry, when, uh, when there is uh, glucose in the environment, uh, E. coli does not make, uh, does not make the gene, uh, that does not make the gene uh, that it needs, does not make the protein that it needs to eat lactose. Okay. And the way it does that is essentially by tuning the number of these repressors. And that number is tuned by these sugars. OK. It's, it's so cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So it's, it's, it's really it's impressive. impressive. But you know, I really hated biology when I was in high school. And then I started learning all this stuff. And I just got completely hooked on it. Because these little, especially biology and bacteria, because these little micron-sized cells, like they're single cells, and they like they're like little computers, little you know, little machines that do these cool things, and then and they do them using physics because they do use molecules, and then it's like trying to piece you know figure out a puzzle. How does this thing work, right? How does it how is it able to do? It? So I think it's fun. Um, yeah, great question. All right, John, you got a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so when you talk about your statistical analysis, um, you talked about the energy. Now, is that going to be the energy just between, um, say, a single piece like the repressor and the RNA? Because if it is, if, if it's working off charges, do the uh, repressor and polymerase not interact with each other? And how would that affect your statistics then? Uh, OK. So. Uh, the the general yeah so uh, the, the, you ask you, all these 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 are great questions you're asking uh, so uh, so pretty much all these interactions they're electrostatics right because there's there's you know forget about gravity clearly forget about the nuclear forces and the weak forces it's all everything you know life is electrostatic so Coulomb's law that's it done. Right. So the only thing about electrostatics in the cell is that because there are all these ions around that are floating around, if you have two charged objects, if let's say this is a positive charge and this is a positive charge, they immediately get surrounded by negatively charged ions that are just floating around. And these ions essentially screen the charge. Okay. So as soon as you separate two charges by, and you can calculate this, 
cells by actually a couple of nanometers, then they don't know each other, about each other. They essentially, because of this cloud of ions, they become essentially electrically neutral. And so they don't interact. The only way they know about their charge is if you get them close enough that these, that these ion clouds start overlapping. So in other words, electrostatic interactions between molecules, proteins, in particular in the cell, they only happen when they come in close contact. Okay, so, so when you think about the polymerase interacting with the DNA, it feels the charge of the DNA only when it's like a couple of nanometers close to the DNA. As soon as it gets a little bit away from the DNA, it's free to move around. So the only way that the polymerase and the repressor can interact is if they're actually on top of each other. Yeah. And it's thought, and you know, or we, have, we actually have experiments now that show this, it's thought that this interaction is essentially, effectively very simple. In other words, when the, this repressor is sitting on the DNA, okay, repressor sitting on the DNA, the polymerase uh, just simply can't get there. It's like a steric, it's effectively a steric interaction. Meaning, it's just like, think of this as a, you know, as a hard object, and another hard object just can't get in there. The reason hard objects don't go through each other is electrostatics, right? The reason uh, this can sits on my hand, it doesn't go through my hand, the, the, the force, uh, I mean, the, the physical force that's keeping the can on my hand is electrostatics, right? Between the items in the can and the atoms that are in my hand. So in that sense, it's that, you know, and that's, that's how the, that's the same, that's how the repressor keeps the polymerase from getting on the can. And the only way to get on the DNA is the repressor falls off and the polymerase and can get on. Right. Did, I, did that, did that uh, answer your question? I, I, I feel like I didn't quite get to your, mm. Well, sort of. It explains how they don't interact with each other. But that, if that's a problem, doesn't that affect how it connects to the RNA? Then? Say it again. Then, I'm sorry? So you were say saying something about the RNA. Uh, I'll say um, that kind of explains how they wouldn't interact with each other. But if that's the case between those two, it kind of makes me think that would help, uh, keep it from interacting with the RNA, too. And then it should affect the statistics there, too. So just to make sure you're saying RNA, but you mean the DNA. But that's just you mean the the RNA is the thing that the, so the, the polymerase, my hand, gets on the DNA and then it moves along the DNA and produces the RNA. You're thinking about the DNA, right? Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah. So right. So what's going on is that yeah, the polymerase interacts with the DNA, the repressor interacts with the DNA, and the repressor and the polymerase interact. So there's energy. So, but they, you know, they. So there's, in other words, you can think of the. So in terms of uh, thermodynamics, you can think of there being essentially, you can think of there being four states. One state is just the DNA on its own. The next state is this, when the uh, repressor is bound to the DNA. That's state number two. State number three is the polymerase bound to the DNA. And the third state might be when the well, all three are there. That's what you're asking about, right? I was just thinking, like you said, the uh, ions keep the repressor and the uh, polymerase from interacting, and it's negligible in the uh, probability. Then would the ions not also affect the probability of those sticking to the DNA? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. My comment about ions, um, sorry if I was not clear about that, just that you know, when you think about electrostatics, we, we, you know, and, you know. We teach you guys that it's a long-range thing. It's Coulomb, right? That the forces go as one over r squared, right? That means that no matter how far you're apart, you're going to feel some electrostatic force. And my comment about ions was just that that one over r squared Coulomb law no doesn't hold when you have free-floating ions. I mean, it does for all the charges, but effectively what the ions do is they screen out the big charges, and now the interaction becomes short range. It doesn't go as 1 over r squared. Actually, it decays exponentially with uh, this. The potential is no longer Coulomb. It's something that would be called in particle physics the Yukawa potential. It's an exponentially decaying potential with distance. So that was, this, that was the comment about charge. Cool. So you've got a couple people in the audience who are in E and M. 
So electricity magnetism, uh, statics right now, and so that's what's informing some of the questions. And I think what you just illuminated there with the uh, shielding was something they've not seen before. And so that would be something cool to ask about and to get more talking uh, going on in class about what happens when you have that shielding yeah. uh, of a charge by other charges or uh, dipoles in the environment. Yeah. Some of the students here yeah. haven't even had um, EM1 yet, and most of you, I don't think anyone here has had thermal physics yet. Not yet. Okay. And so the Boltzmann uh, potentials there and the probability distribution is a really good segue into hey, this is what you're going to be doing in the spring. So that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. So, uh, um, I, 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 yeah, sometimes I try to throw that in when I, when I teach, uh, when I teach uh, uh, freshman electrostatics uh, is, is, this, is this issue of, of screening because it's really, uh, so uh, if you have, it, it, I call it electrostatics in salty water. So the question is, if you uh, if you, uh, if you want to repeat, if you want to do all the ex you know kind of uh, experiments uh, that normally people do in air, where you charge spheres and you put them closer and further apart and do all that kind of stuff, if you want to, to try to do some of that in salty water, uh, it will look very different. The fundamental laws are the same, of course. It's not that there's all of a sudden something that replaces Coulomb's law. But because there are all these little molecules that are charged that are floating around, they make the big charges behave in a way that's very different from Coulomb. And, uh, that's really cool. That's that is really cool. And it, it looks like it would be something that could be brought into an undergraduate class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Nice. Definitely. If you're interested in doing that, Will, I, I have some notes. Uh, I would, uh, yes, yes, definitely. I think that would be awesome. <laughs> We yeah, can, figure out, we window can, torture, up, we can so. figure out how to torture these poor souls. <laughs> well, I mean, it, that's a great opportunity. You're, you're, you're talking biophysics, but then you can also talk about, you know, nuclear physics. You've got you yes, I mean, The cool thing is, is that this screening, that this screening of uh, the big charges by little charges is essentially what happens. It's even, you know, it gets into some of the very fundamental things in physics, like the fact that the electron charge changes as depending on how close you get to the electron. It has to do with uh, quantum fluctuations. So there's, and uh, it gets into questions about normalization and things like that, where uh, all the rage in particle physics in the 70s and, and maybe 80s, um, which were actually questions that got me into physics because I thought they were super cool. Uh, and here I am talking about cells now, so go figure. <laughs> well, how many folks here are taking quantum right now? John, okay, a couple, couple. You, you guys asked Dr. Manon about if the charge on the electron stays constant as you get close to it and see how he squirms with that. <laughs> he can answer it, but he's not going to expect it coming. <laughs> That'll be cool. Do you have any other uh, questions that you want to ask before I get to ask one? Uh, fire away. Uh, you had talked about resistance very briefly uh, with different diseases and infections. How useful is this model in uh, making new drugs and uh, deciding the lifespan of a drug right now? Uh, uh, so, uh, 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 I mean, the short answer, it's at the moment, it's useless. I mean, uh, in other words, uh, uh, the, we're, at, we're at a stage now um, where we're uh, trying to understand some of these very fundamental processes in biology like gene expression in a quantitative way, okay? Meaning we'd like to be able to do the, make the following prediction. If you tell me, you know, what kind of cell you have and what kind of environment it is, I, won't be, I should be able to predict for you how much of a certain protein it produces. No one can do that right now. And uh, the, you know, the dream and whether we'll ever get there is who knows, that's why it's a dream, right? Is uh, is that uh, if we can, you know, that by starting at this level and then building up from there, is that maybe one day we'll be able to turn engineering into a—I mean, sorry—we'll be able to turn medicine into like an engineering discipline, right? What I mean by that is, you know, we worked very hard over hundreds of years, you know, almost a millennium, to come up with something like the laws of hydrodynamics, and we understand the laws of hydrodynamics so well that we have aerospace and hydrodynamic, you know, and aerodynamic, you know, we have plane engineering to the extent where, you know, people can now design an airplane 
a 787 on a computer and it just flies, right? Because we understand all the all the basic science involved with it and all the engineering has been solved. So you don't have to even make model planes anymore. We can't do anything like that with drugs, right? We cannot say, ah, you know, I, you know, Yane was just in my office. I, I, you know, took a sample of his blood. I sequenced his DNA. Uh, this protein machine is malfunctioning. What he needs is the following chemical compound, which will make this machine work again, right? That's not how we do drugs. What we do is there's some disease which happens in a lot of different people in some statistical way, and then we make some compound, and then we test it, and we look for statistical evidence that it works on an average person. But that doesn't mean anything about whether it will work on me. In fact, it might even kill me, right, if I'm unlucky, right, if I have a side, bad reaction. So, uh, so I don't think we'll ever get to this dream of having medicine be like engineering uh, unless we can solve the fundamental science problem, which is understanding these processes that govern cellular behaviors in a quantitative way. In other words, unless we turn biology, I, you know, this is provocative, but we need to turn biology into physics, okay? Because <laughs> physics, you know, physics, is, you know, physics, as we're told in high school, is about inanimate objects. That's, to me, that's silly. Physics is the science that describes nature in using the law, using the language of mathematics. That's what physics is, and it's just that we've decided to divide nature into, you know, non-living and living. But it's, that's a very arbitrary decision. I mean, a very arbitrary division. We don't even have a good definition of what life is. It's really arbitrary, right? It's just I'm a little more complicated, presumably, than this, this can. Okay. So, <laughs> so it's a little harder to describe being mathematical. But it doesn't mean you can't do it. And so, you know, there's a bunch of us who are foolish enough who think eventually life will yield to a mathematical description. In other words, it will yield to physics. <laughs> Awesome. So how does that answer your question? Uh, it answers it. <laughs> <laughs> but the short answer was, it's useless. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? And in my defense, I'm sure that's what they said about the first transistor they made in Bell Labs in the 50s. <laughs> what are you going to do with it now? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so one of the things we're doing is we're actually trying to trying to use these. This, so the way it's useful is we're trying to use these models to actually build circuits, genetic circuits in cells with specified properties. And we've become pretty good at that. I mean, good in the sense that right now in my lab we're building an, an AND logic gate inside a yeast cell. So the yeast cell will take two chemicals and combine them in a logical way. In other words, I have chemical A and chemical B, and only when there's a lot of A and B will I get some gene expression. And if there's either of them is in little amounts, then I will get nothing. Right? So, and uh, I'm trying to make I'm trying to make a logical AND gate using, and the way we design the genetic circuit is using the exactly this mathematics that I briefly outlined. And it works. Yeah. In other words, what, what you're talking about right now leads into uh, a question I see that uh, has been posted from Twitter. The question is, this biological system can be considered a stoastic uh, molecular computer? Can it be? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's exactly how we think about it. And so, uh, so, uh, you know, so these, these simple models in, in very simple situations, of course, at this point, Allow us to actually program these computers. Wow! And uh, and so and so and there's you know there's there's you know people out there who are trying to program you know that was my last slide that I just kind of breezed through but are trying to pro reprogram for instance E. coli or not quite E. coli but some bacteria so that you can introduce them into the human body and then these th these reprogrammed bacterial cells would would swim through your body and find a cancer cell and then eat it up. Hmm. So, so that's a project that a guy at MIT has been pursuing and he's shown and he has had some success. I mean it's not nowhere near at the level of you know putting it in real patients and stuff like that but in sort of control lab environments under very specific conditions he can do this. And, uh, and then the other ideas are to re-engineer cells so they make biofuels. Hmm. Things like that. You know so this is this is happening happening a lot and uh, and it's it's really interesting and it's a little scary as well because no one really knows if we're gonna make some cells that do something really bad <laughs>
<laughs> mm. so, uh, so actually, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, people from kind of social sciences ethicists that show up at conferences that I go to, the, 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 and there's lots of discussion about how does this technology proceed in a safe way. Right. Because it'd be kind of sucky if we ended up killing the whole human race. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, it's it's something that physics has experienced before. You know, when we uh, invented the atomic bombs. Yeah. You know? and, and so this is another one of those uh, situations. Thankfully, we're not in a time of war, but uh, where we need to think about what, what, what is the potential for uh, something wrong to happen here. Yeah, no, I, I've even been interviewed by the FBI, uh, counterterrorism, <laughs> wondering whether these kinds of ideas can be used to construct bugs or weapons, not by the U.S. government, but by, you know, people who want to do bad things. So, um, so uh, it's, um, yeah, so actually our level of control is actually quite, uh, at, the level, at, this, at the level of these bacterial cells is getting, is, is quite frightening in some sense. Yeah. But, but, to, but, but, you know, but to make weaponizable bacteria, it's, it's silly. That's, that's yeah. it. uh, it's not, not feasible. Yeah. Well, there's all sorts of problems with them. Yeah. Just, uh, I, I, uh, the scarier thing are viruses. Um, so uh, there was this. This was a uh, this in a lab in Holland that was sponsored by, which had actually U.S. support. They figured out how to make uh, five mutations to uh, to uh, H, like an H1N1 type virus. But those five mutations made the virus uh, be airborne and infected. So it the ability to spread uh, many many cold. And actually, they were, um, they, that was an interesting debate. Uh, they, they were going to publish their research in, in science, and uh, the, the paper was put under embargo uh, because uh, governments didn't want this information to come out. So, uh, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's, there's really kind of interesting, uh, I think, and important debates going on in the, in the scientific world about how to, you know, how to proceed with these ideas carefully. Mm -hmm. Well, on a, a little happier note, could you kind of tell these young people what your trajectory was, starting uh, off as a young person, and then how do you end up doing uh, this sort of research? It's fascinating. How, how did you get into doing it? Yeah. So, uh, um, so yeah. So um, I, I started. You know, I started like uh, uh, so. Um, I got really, you know, I got excited about physics when I was in high school, and then I went to college and majored in physics. This was actually all in uh, in former Yugoslavia, uh, which is not that important, but uh, it's maybe amusing. But anyway, so uh, uh, oh, but the being from Yugoslavia bit is important because, like most other sort of uh, countries from from that part of the world, uh, we didn't have any money for experiments. So if you were, you know, you were told that the only uh, research we're doing is very mathematical and very theoretical. So when I came to, uh, to the U.S. to do my Ph.D. work, which ended up being at Cornell, I was hell-bent on, on doing uh, particle physics, in fact, string theory at the time, because it was, this was the late 80s, and, and uh, string theory was the, sort of the, this hot new uh, thing that came out in the mid-80s. And so actually, I ended up doing that. I, I I did my PhD not on string theory, but I did on 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 very formal, very mathematical parts of physics uh, that had to do with uh, um, essentially developing kind of uh, certain kinds of mathematic uh, developing a mathematics. And one of my and then I went on to do a postdoc at Princeton in more or less in math. Uh, so I was hired as even as a professor at Brandeis to do very formal uh, mathematical physics, if you will. So in other, when I say formal, just the math I was doing then was had nothing to do with any kind of experiments, living or non-living. But it was a lot of fun, and uh, and uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I enjoyed it tremendously. But what happened is I, I came to Brandeis, and then I just met a bunch of people here who uh, who are uh, who are really phenomenal biologists. And uh, and then it turned out that there were some people in biology here who uh, who had physics PhDs and had kind of or had physics training, not PhDs, but in other words, you know, if you went to them and talked to them about statistical mechanics, they knew what you were talking about. They, they remember their thermal courses as when they were undergraduates and stuff like that. 
And so in talking to these uh, other faculty here, I realized that they had all this data. So this is what's been going on in biology uh, in the last, you know, 20 years is people have gotten really good at, you know, doing experiments on cells where they get quantitative data, and it's not, and it's like you do it one day, you do it the next day, and it's the same, you know, num, you know, it, it's it doesn't like it's not changing all the time. I always thought in biology there was nothing, there was no regularities. Everything was in flux. Everything was changing. You could never kind of pin it down and describe it in some simple way that 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 would allow you to use mathematics. Anyway, so 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 they showed me experiments, like my first uh, experiments that were shown to me were by this guy Jeff Gallus, who I work with a lot now. So he showed me some data on these motors, like, you know, I showed you this, he was working on these motors that walk, right? And when they walk, they burn energy and they do useful work because they're pulling things. So, you know, all, all the stuff you're being taught in intro physics or whatever, it all, you know, you can talk about work and energy and efficiency. But it turned out the way these motors were working, it seemed like it defied the second law of thermodynamics, which is a big no-no, right? And, you can you every law is up for sale, not but not the second law. That, that's just not that's not going to happen. It's 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 a funny law of physics, right? Because it's in some sense about probabilities, and and, and in some ways it's not even about the natural world. It's about how we count and information and things like that. Anyway, so so you can't you know you can't have something just violating the second law. That's that's not going to happen. So that was a puzzle, right? So then it's like how you know what's going on here. You know, we, he convinced me that he was doing the measurements properly. We never kind of sorted it out. I actually, a few weeks ago, I asked him about that. He's like, yeah, he said, I still don't know what the hell's going on there. That was 15 years ago, right? So, uh, but that got me kind of thinking, wow, there's something really, you know, interesting here. So I started messing around, and, and, and then slowly this bio thing kind of took over my whole research and uh, pushed out all the other stuff that I, that I started when I, uh, when I started here at Brandeis. So, um, so anyway, yeah, it was uh, it was it was completely by uh, by random chance. Of course, at this point now, uh, like my lab, there's uh, there's uh, dozens and dozens of labs in physics departments around the country that are pursuing this research. So for you young people, it's it's if you want to, you know, if you're interested in pursuing a, a, a sort of a, a research career, or even if you're not interested in research career, if you think it's fun going to uh, a uh, get a PhD, which is really why I went to get a PhD because I thought it'd be a fun thing to do for five years. I honestly did not expect to be a professor. I was like, I'll go for five years. I was living in Europe, you know, sort of this kind of Eastern Bloc country, and I thought, oh, this could be fun going to the U.S. five years doing science. I'll figure out what I'll do after that, and then I just liked it, and so I stayed in it. But um, but you know, if you think you know, spend, and I think it is a lot of fun spending five years just focusing on science. And then if this sounds like fun, then there's just a ton of physics departments around the country where you could be, you know, in a physics PhD program working on cells. You could be in an electrical engineering department writing, uh, you know, making uh, genetic circuits. Uh, you can be in a mechanical engineering department uh, studying this, these, these problems of how cells contract and move. I mean, it's... Uh, it's uh, it's become a really fascinating thing to see in in, in the world of uh, especially uh, academic science where the, all these disciplines are just kind of at the at the level of pH at the level of research are just in many places just becoming you know just merging and infiltrating each other and there's all sorts of fun things to do if you're a physicist and being a physicist gives you being a physicist gives you something really special which is you know how to think about nature in the language of mathematics, and I think that's desperately needed in biology these days. So, you know, biology needs you guys. Do it. <laughs> oh, I that definitely echoes some of the things that I've, I've told you guys. Biology, you know, and, uh, you know, there's tons of really interesting problems in physics, and just saying biology is now actually one of those interesting problems. Right. I think uh, things that I've said before to the, the physics club is that interesting things are happening at the interfaces between fields. And so where physics and biology rub up against one another, you know, where you're able to look at a tremendous amount of data that someone's taken in biology and recognize, hey, that looks, sort of looks like a stat mech problem. Let's see if I can't apply some rudimentary model to that. It doesn't have to be perfect. Right? But doing some simple modeling will get you far away in a field where you're flooded with data and you don't have a good mathematical model for it. They got great uh, qualitative models for what's going on, 
that was always the thing that frustrated me when I took biology in college was, where's the math? And I thought, well, maybe it's because it was a freshman level class and it, it, it gets more interesting and more technical as you go up. And that might be. Uh, but I think as physicists, you guys are able to bring more of that uh, mathematical, quantitative nature to the modeling process that would help in other fields. Well, what's funny about about math math and biology is that actually the math was there to begin with. I mean, uh, um, you know, a lot of genetics and uh, a lot of sort of early, uh, or even, you know, work, very important in the early 20th century on evolutionary theory was very mathematical, very important and very mathematical. Uh, in some sense, uh, um, it got kind of forgotten in the 60s and 70s through the 80s because of the sort of the gene revolution, the fact that, uh, that uh, uh, by figuring out the structure of DNA, uh, you could now sort of, um, you know, play around with DNA and, and, and do all these kind of cool experiments where you knock out genes and find what each different genes do and, and, and so you could kind of really proceed very far in this qualitative fashion and, uh, and that sort of made it so that math was put on the, on the wayside but it was there to begin with uh, so in some sense it's just coming back now it's not that it yeah you know. And then it's and like you said well it's, it's very much driven it's totally driven by data not by you know bunch of physicists who don't have anything better to do. It's driven by the fact that uh, there's tons of quantitative data and uh, if there's ever going to be any reason that comes out of the data, you have simple math models that can capture some fraction of it. Okay. Do we have any other questions from the audience or from Twitter or Facebook? We're good? Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for paying attention. Thanks for all your great questions. <laughs> uh, Let's give a round of applause. I'm, uh, I'm gonna go get my pizza now. Actually, I'm gonna get some pie. Uh, uh, hey, there's plenty here. Just come up. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been great. I think this is a great first uh, Google Hangout with Physics Today and SPS National. So, look forward to doing this again in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks for organizing. Uh, well, thanks a I'll lot. I'll get this uploaded and ready to be on uh, YouTube for anyone else to watch it soon. Great. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye bye. Bye, guys. Good luck. Cool. Thank you. See ya. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>